everybody, this is Kelly from The Truth and Story, and I am here to do a walkthrough that is long overdue. Um, bend there. Um, long overdue. You know, I think I kind of paralyzed myself uh, of doing a walkthrough of this deck because I, I think it's so stunning, uh, and there is so much amazing information in this guidebook that I just think I, I got a little bit, um, I'm not going to lie, I got a little bit intimidated uh, to do this walkthrough, which is ridiculous, because I love Shakespeare so much, so much. I did another walkthrough of a Shakespeare tarot. I think it actually calls itself the Shakespeare Oracle, which I quite love, um, and I got out all my, my Shakespeare books. So I'm not going to do that because uh, this book is really amazing and you know I've, I've run across this of late right uh, there have been some decks that have been just like whoa you know just the book and I believe you can actually get this book separately from the deck I will put a link to the uh, creators website uh, below but I believe that you can actually get this book separately as well as the creator of this has an amazing website so if you want to see these cards like even in bigger glory than you know I'm obviously recording it those are probably scanned images so if you want to see them you can go to the website and you can see the the images and then there is part of the write-up of the cards now from what I can see it's not the whole thing but it is a pretty big chunk of the text is actually on the website so you can get a really strong feeling for both the cards in the beautiful images as well as a very um, solid uh, grasp of how uh, the creator has put the deck together in the guidebook but to me and we're, we're gonna get to these I promise but this I mean look at this it looks like um, the books that you would get I can't remember what these are called, They're like an Oxford, uh, yeah, Oxford's World Classic. So it looks like, you know, the Oxford Classic books, which I think is a wonderful. Um, he also has the uh, author by Anonymous, uh, which I thought was really interesting um, and fun. Uh, so he definitely has a little tongue-in-cheek. Uh, the cover illustration is Edward de Vere, uh, a.k.a. William Shakespeare. Now, I will say... Uh, I will say I am not as sold as the author uh, on the um, on who William Shakespeare is and there is a lot of controversy about that or a lot of discussion about that or a lot of debate about that in the academic spheres right and certainly when I was in college there was uh, uh, conversations in which I took a lot of classes on Shakespeare there were definitely conversations about who was uh, William Shakespeare, uh, who wrote, wrote William Shakespeare's plays, uh, who exactly was, you know, William Shakespeare, was he this Will, uh, Will Shakespeare, or was he that a pen name for somebody else? Did William Shakespeare steal uh, the... Um, plays from somebody else is it a mishmash that just over time we've gotten you know several different authors kind of smashed together under the name of William Shakespeare so there's a lot of different um, um, a lot of different things to think about and to discuss and he does uh, the creator of this deck goes into that and certainly uh, there is a lot of information here uh, about the date. You've got sources for the cards themselves. I thought there was, let me find it. So he talks a little bit about it here in the William Shakespeare. And he definitely goes with, um, upholds the idea that um, Edward de Vere uh, it w is, the, is Shakespeare. And in the back, he does have a chronology, uh, which, uh, sh you know, following uh, Edward de Vere and, you know, kind of uh, setting him forward as being the real Shakespeare. I am not going to get into that in this particular video because uh, that would be, I think, a whole entire video in and of itself that probably not uh, many of my viewers would be overly interested in. 
I will be completely honest, and I hope I don't horrify the amazing creator of this deck, but for me it doesn't really matter. Um, and I know that it matters to the historians, and I know that it matters to various scholars, um, but for me, the core Shakespeare plays that I adore and love, and the sonnets and things, um, they have become that sort of step aside, a step apart from the real, whoever the real man is, and whatever the murky history of the real man is, uh, the, his works, or their works, or what, <laughs> whatever it may end up being, the works themselves have kind of come to stand alone. It's very similar to mythology, that understanding that what the truth um, is very, my my name is the truth and story because sometimes the story becomes more important and than the actual factual history and so in some ways for myself again I'm not I do not purport to be a scholar of Shakespeare for myself uh, who exactly William Shakespeare is um, no longer matters because he's entered the realm of mythology and you think of the um, you know houses in in the past even in American uh, history past where where they would often have you know works of Shakespeare and the Bible you know those would be considered you know if you had two books those would be books that you would have um, that that sort of myth and that sort of um, stature uh, is there regardless of who penned the words uh, originally. So it's not something that I'm going to spend a ton of time on, but I did want to point it out because it's clearly important to the creator of this deck. So we have that we have that going on. We also um, uh, he talks a little bit about. Um, the tropes that, that are used in Shakespeare, and certainly, obviously, that is going to carry over into the cards. Uh, it talks about the dramatis persona, uh, the characters that comprise uh, the tarot deck, as well as, obviously, the literary kingdom, as he calls it, of William Shakespeare's written works. Um, and I love all of the Shakespeare Tarot's worlds a stage and all the cards merely players. As every character is portrayed by an actor, even if only in the theater of our mind, and a character may call to mind a person from real life, be it Lord Burley or our mother, every character remains at core a persona. Um, I love that. So, at, so as with the chariot, the characters Caesar, Polonius, and Burley are the vehicle um, of the cards act and actor. If we see Elizabeth I in the High Priestess card, it is the emblem we see personified and stage managed and not the woman herself. Of course, this is true of vision and of all human relations, even those we know intimately. One of the attributes of the deck itself is to glimpse obliquely the essence which remains hidden beneath her spirit as E.R. called Burly. So I really like that. Um, it says, unlike the modern modern disclaimer, in a Shakespeare tarot, any similarity to persons living or dead is pure. That is to say, a similar a similarity only. A Roman a clef of a Roman eclef, coincidence and intention both. Um, so I love that. It is, any any similarity is pure. It is, it's there for a reason, right? So I really like that. He also talks about one of the key interesting factors in terms of, you know, looking at this as a deck. One of the interesting factors that we have here is the fact that the deck is played out in horizontal because life is a stage, right? Um, let me get to, there are actually also some extra cards in here. Okay, here we have, there are a set of 16 um, sort of extra cards, almost like an appendix of the book um, or an apocrypha added cards. Uh, but can we just talk for a moment about the backs? The backs are, in my opinion, I probably have them upside down. Nope. It is the binding. The back of the book is if you had the book spread out of Shakespeare's work. And it is so stunning. It is probably one of my absolute favorite ever backings on a deck. But I'm going to set those aside. And as I was saying, uh, one of the neat things about this deck is that it is set horizontally. And that was done on purpose. And I think it's quite smart for a, a deck that is uh, a collage deck. 
uh, I think that that's smart. It definitely gives some scope and some breadth to the cards. Um, but it does talk about how the world is, is the world of the stage, Shakespeare's world, and the world humans inhabit is a horizontal one. Accordingly, the tarot has outgrown its pubescent stage as playing card and become itself theater and play, replete with incident, interval, intricate, mese et signe, I'm sure I cannot pronounce that, and dramatic isolation. Um, so as a venue then to accommodate the texture and depth of William Shakespeare's work while providing room to reward the ruminative eye, the Shakespeare's tarot has taken an unprecedented direction. The cards are presented horizontally, emulating the world of dram dramaturgical staging renaissance painting and everyday three-dimensional human intercourse in more ways than one then each card itself is a stage and turning shakespeare himself on his side all of the world is a stage it is sincerely hoped that what discomfort this brave new world initially rests is put to rest by how beauteous mankind is that has such people in it <laughs> absolutely love it absolutely love it um he also talks about, you know, interpreting the actual, what is the play? What is what's going on in the cards? And it talks about how one interprets and understands this tarot is an open and personal as one how one interprets and understands Shakespeare's canon. Significance within the imagery is as varied as the poet's words and their meanings. The correspondence of character and plot to ideas inherent in the giving card of the tarot echoes how Shakespeare himself wielded and forged his sources, be they historical, literary, or idea, ideational. The chemistry of a cast at any given time and the receptivity of his audience are an aspect of the unknown made manifest, given voice and made known in part through art, in part through nature. Through human agency, art and nature assay one another and are assayed, creating something non parallel greater than either were alone. So it just talks about however you want to approach this, it is what it is, right? Um... So I think that that is pretty cool. So he makes note of that. And then he starts out with the minor arcana here. Um, <clears throat> so I probably I should start do the same here. But I'm going to, because I already have them in order, I'm going to go to the major arcana here. Um, and then I am going to just read this first section of the fool not all of it because you will see there's quite a lot of information but i just want to give you an idea of what you get in this and again uh, i'm not going to spend copious amounts of time on this amazing guidebook because you can bear i'm going to have the link right below in the description box and i really urge you if you love shakespeare if this deck in any way appeals to you i really urge you to go to the website and look at these images in full glory as well as be able to read through all of the chunks of all of the of the cards and really get a feel for uh, the writing and the beauty of the cards um, so here it, we have an image of the card itself on I believe all of them yes in color as well as the minor arcana so all of them have a nice size almost you know full smaller tarot size if you look at yeah i mean it's pretty much a basic tarot size it, color image beautiful color image which i think is really important because that way you know there's a lot to read here there's a lot to sink into and you can take this off somewhere with you as i intend to do and my brain is working and you know you can just pick one and just start to read it and you've got the color image right there you don't have to find it in the deck that i think is a really big plus with this type of a book that is so meaty and wonderful so we have the image here we have the name of the card which is the fool which on the fool itself is unnamed and you will sometimes find that to be the case you have the dramatis persona so if there are any characters from the plays on it which i believe is on every single card there is some character so here we have lance and auto autolycus cannot pronounce these all of these for astrology we have astrology connections of uranus air and the planet earth and the hebrew letter tav and then it goes into the text where he really talks about the fool. And you can see here quite, 
quite a large section here. He also gives context. Uh, he gives more information about the um, connections to astrology that he puts in. Uh, he also talks about the characters here that we see here, that they are the first and the last fools respectively in the Shakespeare canon. Lance represents the classic clown whose own naivete is epitomized in his devotion to his roguish dog, Crab, which we see here. Uh, the dog's currish behavior mimics that of Lance's man master, Proteus, while Lance, I don't know if it's Lance or Lance's misplaced affections mirror those of the abused Julia. When Crab urinates in polite company, it is Lance who bears the blame. If, like Hamlet, Crab could go backwards, he would bark. Um... And then it goes in and talks about this character. So you have the context of the characters from the plays, which is really great because he does pull off of uh, some plays that I don't have as much experience and or haven't read. And so I think that's fantastic. I can get context of who are in the, you know, who they are and how they fit into Shakespeare's world. And then, you know, the, of course, I can go then read that play, which I have definitely added a couple to my list. Um, and then he also has any of the subtext that needs to go on here. Um, and then I love this aspect of the book because he has something called the intertext. And this is amazing because this is how this particular deck in the world of Shakespeare's characters and life as this play here, how are they interconnected? How do the characters from the same play interconnect and talk to each other? And so here we have uh, intertext that would go with the fool as the king of staves, Leontes, the cups, uh, six of cups, Perdita, the six of swords, Hermione, and the knight of staffs, Julia. So we know those other characters are ones that we might want to look at, as well as if they show up in a reading together, that can again add some other layers, which would be very interesting. So we have that, uh, all that information, like that is a lot of information. I love this. Um, so uh, and that is definitely uh, holds true for all of the cards. Uh, I'm saying some of them even more so. Uh, there are sometimes images. Uh, there are you know extra images that might apply or have some kind of relation. But you know, drawings, a letter written in French by Shakespeare, um, signatures, different sh signatures here, all kinds of additional wonderful information. It's it really is a treasure. Um, this is a treasure trove. And again, I you know I don't want to. Um, belabor the point. Um, I highly recommend you go to the website and check some of it out. So, and I will read some passages as we go along, uh, but I really recommend that you check out his website so you can get a wonderful feeling for uh, the amount of work um, and intention that has gone into this deck. So, let me in one of the oracles and we'll come back to these at the end uh, in here so I can get back to it. So let me zoom in. Oops. Of course this is a wonderful setup for a for filming having it horizontal. We can really get up and close in there. The Fool is quite different than the other cards. Again there's no writing on it whatsoever and this is often the case uh, where you will find this uh, sometimes the Fool and then obviously the Death uh, card can be unnamed. Now, again, let's just take a moment to look at that backing. Oops, now I do have it upside down. Let's take another moment to look at that amazing backing perfection, absolute perfection. Um, let me put that back with the oracle so I don't mix it up. So here we have the full card, which looks like the open pages of the book with our two examples of the full here as we talked about. This is a collage deck, and as, as most of you who follow my channel know, I am not a huge fan of collage decks. And... Um, when Bart, my friend Bart, had first pointed this deck out to me, I was uh, intrigued, but at the same time, I generally don't like collage decks. But I love this horizontal format because it really gives space for it. 
and it, they're just stunning. I just, you know, I cannot even begin to say how stunning these are. If especially if somebody's a, as a an intuitive reader and really pulls little images and things and pieces of from a card, there's just so much to work from. So the next one that we have is the magician. Now I will say that. Um, there are some concerns as to using this as a reading deck, um, knowing what cards you have. Most of the cards, I'm just going to show you here, the High Priestess, many, of, especially the um, Major Arcana, have the words High Priestess, or so Pappas, which, you know, a lot of the older decks had a Pappas, and then we have the Virgin Queen here. So we know what card this is because it's actually labeled, and most of the cards are that way. Um, obviously, the Fool does not, but that's pretty obvious. It stands out as the Fool. It also stands out differently from the rest of the deck. Um, the Magician card, unless I'm missing it, and I will admit that I do not have the best eyesight on the planet, uh, but unless I'm missing it, the Magician card does not have that, although he just kind of stands there very magician-y. So the name is Magician or Prospero, uh, which is from one of my favorite plays, and there is actually also uh, the crown, the five of crowns is Caliban as well. Uh, so I love that. But I'm going to read this uh, because, as you can see, there's a lot that's going on here. But when you look at the guidebook, um, there is uh, a lot of direct explaining um, what each of these different things are, which I think is wonderful. Um, and so here we have... The Magus Prospero has been in exile for many years, during which time he has studied and perfected his craft of magic. He is master of the minor arcana spread out on a table stage left. Uh, so we can see uh, the we can see the cup here. We can see a sword here. We can see staff here. So we can see coins here. So we can see this set out here, which is wonderful. Um, and embodied in his wards, Miranda and Caliban on his right. As the first official card of the Trumps, he also proposes to influence aspects of the Major Arcana. This is embodied in the spirit Ariel, seen here in the Tempest. So inside of this cloud of the Tempest here. Uh, Prospero, uh, seen here in the Tempest, Prospero commands, and the card which caps the Trump cycle, the World Globe. Uh, which is the world card. Prospero st stands before his cave. So we're being told, okay, this is what's over here. This is what's stage left. This is what's stage right. This is the cave that he stands before, suggesting Plato's allegory in which prisoners mistake shadow puppets for reality. This is itself an allegory for theater, and Prospero uses his magic to stage a mask on this very spot. Plato's cave also suggests the Soc Socratic method, Sorry, as Prospero is master communicator and teacher. With his right hand, I'm trying to see his right hand, with his right hand from out a cloud he holds a staff, uh, a wizard's wand which he himself will break, alluding to foul staff and the emperor card. Atop his staff is a winged towel right here. It just goes into the circle here. Uh, so it's going through each thing. Uh, atop his um, staff is a winged tongue with the tail of a snake. This may symbolize the art of language, its bewitching power to soar, its cunning ability to tempt. It also happens to closely resemble the Visconti emblem of the city of Milan. Prospero's left hand emerging from a cloud wields a quill with which he writes in a large book, the book he himself will later drown deeper than did ever plummet sound. The sinister hand and quill are later recast in reoccurring roles on um, the crab surfacing from the depths of the moon card. Prospero stands center uh, around him is mystical Eden, but also wild and forbidding. And it goes on and on. Um, it's fantastic because, again, all of these pieces that we are seeing here, he is talking about in the context. So we don't have to, I mean, you can just not even, you know, look here, obviously, um, and just do what you want to do with the card, 
But at the same time, if you really want to know what all of the symbology is for, he addresses that in the book. He also then gives a context for it. So this is the first, uh, the major arcana is aligned with the Hebrew Aleph and the Greek Alpha. He goes into those connotations there. He talks about the word, word, word tempest and how that goes in. Uh, he also talks about how if there was any a real life person uh, attached to the character, he talks about that, such as Prospero being an allusion to Queen Elizabeth I, Magus John D the alchemist, astrologer, and possessor of the largest library in England. So it talks about how that connection is there, making it even a, a double um, a re whammy, right, to use Prospero, as well as that connotation of John D um, as the magician. So it's really, it's just amazing. Um, talks about this Visconti Sforza being a commission by the Duke of Milan, um, and so on and so forth. It's just a wealth of information and context as to why this particular character was chosen for the magician, as well as why, um, what all of these things might bring and mean and bring to the table in different layers uh, in doing a reading, which I think is amazing. So yeah, I just wanted to just give you uh, a, just a taste of how much information is involved here in the writing of this text. So here we have the magician. I love, love, love this card. Here we have the high priestess as the virgin queen. Um, again, it talks about the Roman Aklef. I'm sure I'm spelling, pronouncing that incorrectly, but it talks about how um, this is also a reference of Queen Elizabeth I. So that would be a person that would be a religious station that it might apply to astrology, zodiac signs, the Hebrew letter, all of the different dramatic people that this could relate to, the Virgin Queen, the Virgin Mary, the May Queen, the Virgin Mother and Wife of the Nation, Defender of the Faith, Gloriana, Diana, Artemis, Venus, Astrea, Cynthia, Phoebe, uh, and so on and so forth, the Fairy Queens, the Phoenix, Lucretia. Um, so it has uh, all of that. Uh, and also ties it together how she stands in front of a cave in many ways like Prospera the Magician did. Um, it's just amazing. Um, it's really, really amazing here. Uh, this text uh, that goes with this is really beautiful. Really beautiful. As long as well as the image itself being stunning. Um... And this, the, the High Priestess actually goes on to quite, uh, quite some length. It starts at 197, 98, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 pages of information about the High Priestess, which is stunning. I really love the Empress card in this deck. Now, at first when I saw this, I was kind of like, eh, I'm not a real big fan of geometric shapes. Um, I, it's, it's things that are very shapey uh, tend to not appeal to me, such as in the Fountain Tarot. I think it's, is it the uh, King of Swords? It's kind of got a... Um, uh, triangle shape. It's very geometric. There's a couple like that. And those kind of things generally turn me off. I, I find I'm not very geometric. But this is really amazing because it talks about, uh, you know, we can see the different characters in the windows here. And they represent uh, Titania, the queen of the fairy, fairies, Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazons, and Hermia, um, and Thisbe. And what's interesting is that he talks about how uh, we are not given one definite empress at which to gaze, but fragments of the woman or fragments of different women which conspire to make up an overall and deeper impression of an empress. It even talks about the house itself and the, and the way that we end up having a garden and all of these kinds of things that are really, really beautiful. And it uh, relates, this is related to uh, Midsummer's Night's Dream, which is also one of my favorite decks. Uh, one of my favorite uh, plays. 
there's a lot of, of information here about how the play being seen in three distinct worlds, the mythical, the mortal, and the mechanical, with obviously the Empress of the Mythical being Titania, and so forth. There's a lot of, of amazing information, and it talks about how... Um, saw this uh, one of them when Hermia leaves to follow the Duke and my father she has spoken her last line when Helena recognizes Demetrius as mine own and not mine own her voice is silenced when the dream is over the women return to the world of man's making a world written by a male playwright for a male audience where the women are played by men uh, very very interesting but this whole section uh, on the Empress is so interesting um, and again, it gives us the intertext where we're going to see Theseus as the Six of Crowns. Uh, so I, this card, I at first was like, oh, that's interesting, but now it's one that I really love as well. Here we have, I know I have to go faster than this. Um, I'm not, I promise I will. Um, but here we have the Emperor as Falstaff. And you can see here, here's the Emperor. So there's a lot of texts from the plays, um, but you also have, most of them do have, if not all, well, I guess I'll pay more close attention here. But we do see that the Emperor is here. Uh, and so you would be able to know what it is that you pulled. Uh, I love that we have Shakespeare as the Hierophant. Um, that is pretty amazing. He is the teacher, all of that good stuff. This is the Shakespeare taught to us in school. The structure of the Hierophant card is derived from the ceiling of a cathedral, as if the reader were looking upwards. Looking downwards, then, on us mere mortals, Shakespeare may suggest a god or an icon impeding direct contact with what lies beyond. Um, but yeah, you have to have faith in, in the and it just it goes into all different things uh, about numbers and uh, how how all of the things that are placed in here um, to that has to do with the card. It's just a wealth of information. It's really not just a whole bunch of random things slapped together. It's very very specifically picked through what items would show up here. Um, and so uh, so there we have the hierophant. Uh, we have the lover's card, of, of course, as Romeo and Juliet. Um, it's kind of, uh, and Friar Lawrence, of course, we can't leave him out. Uh, so we have them as the lover's card, which certainly makes sense in a Shakespeare tarot deck. Uh, we have Lord Burley here as the chariot. I love the chess pieces here. Um... In terms of characters, we have Polonius and Julius Caesar. And again, all kinds of context, all kinds of information about the chariot, as well as this particular card. It's just, it's amazing. This is a stunning strength card. Again, you can see that this is strength. Uh, here we do have the words, the chariot. Uh, we also have Julius Caesar and Polonius and Lord Burley written here. Uh, here we have the, just the only text here is the word strength. It's stunning. It's a stunning strength card. Uh, here we have um, the King of Britain's daughter Inogen as, um, I think from Cymbeline, uh, from, as, as the strength person personification of the strength card here. I can't speak. I can't speak. It's just stunning. I can't I can't even begin to tell you how stunning this is. Uh, here we have the beautiful hermit card. Look at this. Again, we have hermit here. Uh, we have Timon of Athens. That is a play that I need to read. Uh, there are, I think, uh, let's see, because it will give us the intertext. Uh, just saying the Eight of Cups. So maybe it was from the other Shakespeare Oracle that there were references to Timon. Um, and I don't believe that I have read that play. Or else I did Timon of Athens. Uh, sorry, the Timon of Athens. Um, and I am not entirely... It says it's generally unliked and unknown. Um, and indeed it isn't concerned with being liked. <laughs> which is quite interesting, right? Um, so I, I need to pull that out and read it because I'm quite intrigued now. But irregardless, this is just beautiful. Oh, I love it. 
Here we have the Wheel of Fortune, a lot going on obviously, and it's about the printing press, which I think is, you know, the winds of fate can be changed by the printing press. I think that is pretty amazing. Uh, represents change, chance, cycle, success, and expansiveness. The reader cannot control the wheel, only learn how to roll with it, how it affects events, how to maybe get out of its way, how to read it. I love that. Um, I just, it goes on and talks about the printing press. It's just amazing. Let's just be honest, it's amazing. Here we have, this is so beautiful. Look at this justice. Uh, this is Shylock, which is, I think, awesome. This justice card is deceptively simple, as if justice were a simple thing. I love this. Most people consider themselves reasonable and fair-minded and are untroubled by considerations of privilege, bias, and the possibility of the impossibility of anything approaching true justice. Uh, yeah. So this is, again, from the Merchants of Merchant of Venice. And, again, it's got the word justice on here, so you're going to know that. The Hanged Man is obviously also written here. It's not going to be very difficult to uh, know anyways. This card is very recognizable. Um, and, of course, this is Hamlet, uh, to be or not to be, and definitely in need of some perspective. Uh, so we have that. We have, for the Death card, we have Titus Andronicus. Um, and I think, is it, see, are there two, I thought there were two death cards. No, maybe that's in the appendix, because there's these extra cards here, so we'll come back to that. But here we have the death card. Uh, the unnamed death card is the only one in the Shakespeare to be totally devoid of color. So even if you go to, which is not a lot of color, there's still color in the full card. Um, and while these all may have muted tones, they do have color in them. And this one does not, so it makes it very clear. And it says, let not your sorrow die, though I am dead. Uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So next here we have, again, lots of information here. Uh, for temperance, we have the play measure, to, measure for Measure. And we have a lot of characters in here. Isabella, Duke Vincentio as the Friar Lodovic, Mariana, Ragazine. We have uh, lots of... Um, cards or lots of uh, characters here. The Temperance card is a real balancing act, but unlike many of the Shakespeare Tarot Trump cards, which depict extremes such as black and white, man and woman, spirit and flesh, Temperance is a card about merging and combining forces, the creation of a dialectic and preeminence of a third way. Oh, I love that. I just love that. And you can almost see that even in the middle with Isabella at the center. She's straddling the dichotomous worlds of judgment and love. Oh, I love this card. And there's beautiful, like, this, like, paintings and things. Um, the very mercy of the law cries out most audible, even from his proper tongue. And Angelo for Claudio, death for death. Haste still pays haste, and leisure answers leisure. Like doth quit like, and measure still for measure. Isabella says, oh, that it were as like as it is true. I mean, look at that gorgeous drawing uh, representation there. It's just a beautiful, um, such a... Uh, meaty deck, a meaty deck of cards, and as a meaty guidebook to go along with that. Um, the next card, which has very similar coloration and energy here, is um, the Devil card with Othello. Um, and here we have, of course, Othello, Desdemona, and Iago. Othello is another one of my favorite plays. <sighs> yes. So, wonderful to have for the, the Devil card. I think that is a really great play to pick for that. Um, here we have the Tower in Macbeth. And we see multiple persona, Macbeth, uh, the Thane of Cawdor, the King of Scotland, the Thane of Glamis, Lady Macbeth, the Queen. 
So it's the castle of the Macbeths, obviously. We have the beautiful star card as Cordelia, which I think is beautiful. She is the youngest daughter to King Lear, and King Lear is also another of my favorite plays. And I love to have Cordelia here as the star. And there is a beautiful section here uh, where he talks about... Uh, at the end of his life, Lear raises Cordelia from the dead, placing her in the heavens, in his, you know, obviously in his mind. Cordelia is clad in the red and white of Prosperina's lilies and violets of Tyrian purple and Tudor rose, blood and semen, heart and soul, the poppy and honey water Dido speaks of to bring on celestial sleep. Here in the star card, as Lear devolves into a child and his child becomes his mother, Thoth's sacred ibis becomes Hennet the pelican, spiritual psychopomp and symbol of self-sacrifice. And on it goes. It's just, it's just so crazily amazing. Look at this card. I mean, come on. Look at the moon. I love, again, we've got the reflection of the moon here. Uh, we have these wolf people. Uh, here we do have the, the lobster or the crab coming up. Um, it says that the moon has often been seen as the sun's lover, but really they are more like brother and sister, traditionally affiliated with the goddess Diana. This would make the moon's male sibling, the sun, her twin Apollo. So we have a Venus and Adonis here. Um, but it's just it's just gorgeous. And to me, very recognizable as the moon, uh, just as a tarot card in and of itself. Again, much, much text. Uh, many pages of text about the moon card, which is amazing. And then we have King Lear as the sun card here, which is really interesting. Of course, that goes with Cordelia uh, as the star card. <laughs> um, there's just so much and of course this is just the major arcana right here we have the judgment card and again we do have the, the word judgment here so it's not going to be difficult to know that when you have it here and this is the final scene of Pericles uh, that we see here um, it is a card of hardship transcended, forgiveness granted, celebration, reward, and rebirth. It contains within it the nuclear family, <coughs> excuse me, symbolic of all families and stands squarely for the willingness and consonance of being judged on one's own merit. And lastly for the world, or for the major arcana, we have the world card, which is the globe. From the stage of the Globe Theater leaps the cosmic dancer represented here on the world card by the mag magical sprite Ariel. A spirit of the air, Ariel manipulates the elements of the earth. His nature is to be free. Um, I love, again, Tempest is, is probably, if I had to pick one, it would be the Tempest. And so I love that, and I love Ariel as um, being showing up. Of course, having the Globe is perfect, and having Ariel is also perfect. <laughs> and so that closes the major arcana.